Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, three. City, city, sibilance, sibilance. Levels check, good, sounds good. One, two, three, rolling and... Much like what you're doing with your podcasts, I just had this image of other documentary filmmakers out there, you know, to share both the, you know, what I call the joy and angst of making a film while you're in the weeds of making it. You know, where do you want to end up at the end of the day? You know, what do you want to be known for? What would success career-wise look like for you? Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 105, and it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and the Doc Lifer Elite Mastermind Group. Whenever I do work in a developing country like a Cambodia or a Nepal or an El Salvador, there is always a good chance that I get sick at least once. And usually it's early on in the trip. It's generally something parasitical in nature, and it has me on the loo often, maybe in bed for a day or two, but generally it's nothing that a bit of metronidazole or Cipro can't take care of. But you know, it can be tricky sometimes working in environments like a Cambodia, where you're stepping lightly through landmine fields or dodging the occasional cobra. Yes, of course, there are medical facilities in the country, but these facilities aren't always equipped with the best equipment or most knowledgeable of staff. So before you go to work in Cambodia, it's always wise to get some hefty travel insurance. At the very least, get something that will cover you for up to 50000 US in emergency evacuation. It's not that expensive and it's worth the peace of mind. We usually get policies with a company like IMG who offer a program called Patriot Travel Medical Insurance. But there are a number of ones out there. You'll probably never use it, right? Hopefully this will be the case. But believe me, any journalist or doc filmmaker or NGO worker who has worked in these environments, they will tell you that it's basically Russian roulette not being covered by some type of travel insurance. Of course, another sort of travel insurance is traveling with someone whom you can trust. Whether it's a friend, relative, significant other, or a coworker, it can be very helpful traveling with someone else who can kind of watch your back or be connected with the world should you come down with a nasty bout of, well, what I like to call the Cambodian craps. Or should you be in a guest house that's approximately five feet from a building that is entirely on fire? I've experienced both of these, the former more times than I'd like to think about. But generally, there is someone beside me or who I can reach out to should I need some help. Such was the case with my friend Patrick, who I've now already mentioned a few times. He's that type of person that you want beside you when the proverbial shit hits the fan, or the back of the toilet, over and over and over. I know, I know, you probably didn't need that, but I wanted to give you some clarity of the, shall we say, Cambodian experience. You know, in case I've romanticized it a bit too much. It was January New Year's Day 2015, and I had just arrived to Kempot with another friend who had been visiting from the States. 
Patrick was going to meet us down in this beach town to fly the drone and get some aerial footage of the famous Kempot Pepper Fields. It was to be the first I'd seen Patrick since we'd met a month or two prior for the first time, so I was looking forward to actually working with him. But the whole bus ride down, my stomach was starting to feel a bit queasy, and by the afternoon, when we'd been in Kempot for a few hours, it was far more than queasy. I knew that I was going to be sick. I tried to stay calm, recognizing the feeling that I'd experienced many times before. I knew what this was. And I knew that I just needed to settle in, try and relax a bit, not get too worked up about it. If I was lucky, it would pass by morning. It didn't pass by morning. In fact, I was up seemingly every 15 minutes throughout the night. I felt terrible for my roomie, who had to endure the sounds of retching and surely didn't get much rest himself because of it. The next morning, not surprisingly, I was extremely dehydrated and my stomach was completely empty. I felt too weak to even move from my bed. Patrick swung by the room and could see that I was in no shape to go out and capture any drone footage for the day. I really felt that I was in a bit of trouble. He just kind of calmly said to my friend, come with me, I know what Chris needs. I was thankful for the calming words, but didn't have much faith that Patrick was going to be able to find anything other than dehydration salts and some water in Kempot. But an hour later, Patrick entered the room, accompanied by a Cambodian man who was holding a medical kit. He came over, checked my temperature, we exchanged a few words, he did speak a little English, and then he hooked me up to an IV and started pumping me with fluids. I don't know if you've ever been hooked up to an IV after being seriously dehydrated, but it is truly nothing short of a miracle. I was like a new man, resurrected from the dead. Within two hours, I was showered, getting dressed, and heading out for some much needed food, and then scouting some locations for shooting later on. Now, to be sure, I have a world of appreciation for this Cambodian doctor who had left his office to come administer me the fluids. Don't get me wrong. But it was the wherewithal of someone like a Patrick who knew that he could not only find a clinic, but that he could convince a doctor using the bit of Khmer language that he had to leave the clinic and come help a foreigner, or Barang as they say in Cambodia, who was holed up in a guest house. This is not something that you can simply take lightly. A lot of people would not know to do this, or at least be so calm about it and do it so quickly. And certainly not from someone who, other than meeting once in a Phnom Penh cafe, was practically a stranger. I remember that day thinking to myself, this Patrick guy is really a special human being. I only hope that I could return the favor someday. Well, that day would come about four years later. And appropriately enough, it would be on the way to Kampot again. You'll remember from our last episode that Patrick and I had been staying in a guest house in the town of Prekaba in the province of Tikayo. It was the Chinese New Year, and we had been filming with a family in one of the small villages outside of town. The proprietor of our guest house had been so kind as to rent us his Toyota Camry for the day. The same man was kind enough to let us rent his car again to drive south to the coast to Kampot for a few days. He informed us that he had never actually rented his car before to anyone and certainly not a Barang. But he believed in our film project and said that we were doing something good for his country by telling the world about Sinsi Samut. How amazing is that? Patrick was driving because he had way more experience driving the Cambodian roads than did I. And Cambodian roads were a generally pretty treacherous experience at the best of times. Houses and stores came right up against the roads. Children and dogs ran into the roads. Roads were sometimes barely roads. And people drove on whatever side of the road had the least amount of cars and dogs and children. So yeah, I had no problem letting Patrick take the wheel on this one. We were about an hour outside of town when we pulled up to a tiny market on the side of the road to get out for a stretch and a coconut. 
Now, coconut waters, juices, milks, they've become all the rage here in the Western world over the past few years. And that's great, don't get me wrong. I'm glad that more people have been turned on to the magical healing powers of the coconut. But you know, long before Coca-Cola or whomever had been marketing their coconut juices to the Western consumer, people in Asia have been using coconuts for everything from drinking to eating to cooking utensils to healing salves. Believe me, the coconut is a well-respected thing in the Asias. And they're everywhere. And they're cheap. Like roughly 60 US cents for a cold coconut cut open with a straw inserted cheap. This was the ultimate in drive through drinks on a road trip. But we didn't simply drive through. That's just not how people like Patrick or I roll through a Cambodia. You see, every place, every interaction, is an opportunity to learn from and to connect with another human being. So we pulled the now already very dusty Camry over to the shoulder of the road, and we sat down at the only two red plastic chairs and table there. We spoke with the Cambodian gentleman who ran the place that basically sold drinks, petroleum from old Pepsi bottles, and packs of cigarettes that were housed in a rusty old metal shelving about five feet from our table. At one point, Patrick got up with his camera, having spotted something across the street that he wanted to check out. He quickly skirted by the rusty shelving, only he didn't quite make it past unscathed. He stopped short of the road, looked down at his leg, and we both could see instantly that he had been cut. And it was bleeding quickly, and fully and completely. We scrambled to locate some napkins. The Cambodian man went to the back of his house. He came back with a fistful of tissues, and he started dabbing at the wound with his own, but shall we say, fairly dirty hands, which were quickly becoming bloodied. There was a surreal 30 seconds or so where three men were frantically, almost uselessly, wiping away at a fairly gushing wound with a few thin pieces of tissue. The man then pointed across the street about 20 meters away. Apparently, somehow, there was a clinic in this tiny roadside town. Patrick immediately hobbled his way over to the place. I was left standing there, looking back and forth at the coconuts, the Cambodian man, and the set of keys that were now in my hand. And I suddenly felt very unsettled. And on my own. I quickly looked up to see the building where Patrick had entered and I got into the car and started it up. I'd been driving for nearly three hours now, the first time in 16 years I'd ever done this sort of thing in Cambodia. Now I'd driven many motos on short trips out into the countryside and a bit in Phnom Penh, but I'd never driven a car anywhere in Cambodia. I was pretty nervous to say the least during the first half of the drive, and truthfully, that slightly nervy feeling, it never left me in the entire drive, but I would at least kind of ease into the zen of the moment. I kept remembering something an expat in Yogyakarta in Indonesia taught me about driving in Southeast Asia, that you're just responsible for what's in front of you, and not to worry about what's coming up from behind or to the side. Again, just worry about what is in front of you. An utterly alien, even frightful concept, I think, for anyone who grew up taking driving classes in the US or the UK. But here in Southeast Asia, this was how traffic flowed. And I knew that if I wanted to be successful, I would need to adapt to this flow. I looked over at my now bandaged friend, who was definitely going to need some actual stitching once we'd arrived to Kempot, and he started playing some music from his iPhone. It was Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody, a song that I'd never really paid much attention to in my life. I didn't need to. It had been thrust upon me by classic rock radio, Wayne's World, and college parties since I could remember. In fact, while I liked Queen as a band, this particular song had always kind of annoyed the hell out of me. But as I made my way down the highway, navigating long broken stretches of the road, dodging massive potholes, dogs, children, lorries, tuk-tuks, motos, this song somehow took on an entirely new meaning. 
And I was, in fact, in those moments, somehow, and miraculously to me, growing quite fond of it. I'm not foolish enough to think that my driving for three hours to take my friend to a proper clinic in Kampot compares to maybe what Patrick had done four years earlier by going out to find me a doctor. But that's not really my point here, which is really more about the importance of finding the right person whom you can depend on when traveling in the developing world. Or as you'll see in the next couple of episodes, the right kind of people whom you can depend on to help you with your documentary film. You've been listening to part five of our Chris and Cambodia series. To see some accompanying media or our trip to Kampot, including Patrick and I in one of these health clinics in Kampot, or if you need to catch up on the earlier episodes, all that you need to do is go to our website at thedocumentarylife.com. Up next on The Documentary Life, we're going to sit down with one of the documentary community's most recognized and respected names, Doug Block, a man who has made a living championing the personal documentary and is the founder of online's largest doc filmmaking community, The D Word. That's all coming up next here on The Documentary Life. Something I wanted to mention before continuing on with today's show. You've probably noticed that we're playing around with some pretty cool fresh sounds on this season of TDL. And I'd like to thank Music Vine for supplying us with those cool fresh sounds. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about how Music Vine might be able to serve your doc project, you can check out the show notes for today's episode, or you can simply go to their website at musicvine.com. Doug Block is an American independent director, camera person, and producer. He has been making important contributions to the world of documentaries since 1991, including films like Homepage, 51 Birch Street, and his most recent 112 Weddings. He is also the founder and a co-host of one of the most successful online communities in the history of the internet, The D Word, an online community for documentary professionals worldwide. Doug Block, it is a pleasure to have you on the documentary life. Oh, thanks, Chris. Can you hear the, and, you and, hear the sirens? And the Live sirens from- have just begun. <laughs> Live from New York. Live from New York, my friends. Exactly. So I think uh, what would be good here is is to get into some of the early documentary films um, and hear a little bit about your early part of your doc life. And there's a film that probably doesn't get talked a heck of a lot about these days, the film The Heck with Hollywood, which I believe was your kind of first official documentary film, was it not? It was indeed. Yeah, Uh, and and kind of the beauty about this, at the time that it came out was when this idea of indie film and the term indie film was really becoming a thing. And I feel like your doc, in many ways was right at the heart of that. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about the film and how that one happened. I was in my early 30s. I'd been freelancing as a cameraman, yeah. actually uh, a video cameraman. Yeah, and right. um, I had always wanted to make films, but I wanted to make fiction films, yeah. you know, what I now call fictitious films. But, um, <laughs> you know, I saw, you know, my my heroes were always, you know, those... Uh, big name movie directors with the director's chair and, uh, um, you know, who did the great classic films. I didn't grow up really having any fondness whatsoever for documentaries. Yeah, Uh, neither did I. And so I, I just kept wondering how the, you know, 
for years and years, I was wondering, how do you break in mm. as a director? It seemed like the ultimate catch-22. Oh, yeah. You, but you can't raise the money unless you have a track record of success. Right. Um, how do you get that track record unless somebody has given you the money to prove that you're capable of doing it? <laughs> and I just thought, oh, that that there's something really interesting about that. And then I heard about this market that takes place every every year that the IFP, Independent Feature Project, um, gets behind. It's gone through many iterations and titles. Back then, it was called Independent Feature Film Market. It's yeah. now called it's now called IFP Week. Uh, yeah, right. And back in those days, it was kind of this freewheeling place where, for like three or four days, filmmakers would bring their completed features to the market. Mm. All these buyers would come and see these. Films and you know most of them, but many of them were by first timers, not all. Yeah. But all of them had been made by hook or by crook. That you know the the you know the the classic tapping out their credit cards or donating blood, <laughs> you know, or, or selling their first child. Yeah. You know, however it was that they they financed it. You know, it was like they pegged all their dreams on this one movie. Totally. Uh, and the very slim odds that this would be, you know, they would be the Spike Lee or Steven Soderbergh who got discovered, you know, with their first film. Yeah. I knew the chances were going to be very long. Yeah. And I picked a couple of filmmakers to follow through that that week there uh, only to find out, oh, I, that's not the story. The story is like, how did they get their films made? And then what's going to happen in the ensuing years as they try and get it out into the world. <laughs> exactly. exactly. But it all came back to that, 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 that conflict at the heart, you know, this, this, this idea that, um, you know, which is a very American dream, like idea oh, that if you, totally is. if you work hard and you, you dream big enough, of course your dreams will come through, you know, come true. And yeah, and, you know, what was clear to me was these dreams were not going to come through for all these filmmakers. And what would happen if I just followed their process through <laughs> this whole phase? And it was it was funny in a gruesome kind of way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, they're all really likable filmmakers. One of the three is Jennifer Fox, mm. uh, who became quite a great documentary filmmaker and now has so finally wild. crossed that over. So wild. <laughs> films um, after all these years you know there's there, there's something to that i think doug and i have to admit I'm, I'm i'm a bit envious that you figured out that in terms of the types of films that you wanted to make you kind of figured out a lot a lot earlier than i did that documentary was a route in which to do that and 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 i think it's brilliant i mean it sounds like you and i have some similarities in terms of you know i think we thought of ourselves as filmmakers or at least want to be filmmakers for a long time and wondered man how do i break into this you know the feature film industry how in the heck does this happen and uh the fact that you use that to sort of be the impetus of your first documentary is 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 a wonderful thing I, I, I give myself credit for, for, you know, one good idea with, with the first film, which was that, well, hopefully more than one good one, but the main, you know, the, the, the main one was that I didn't know how you made films. You know, I mean, I read a lot about them, but I, you know, the, the market felt like an opportunity to get to know the, you know, what goes into fundraising and distribution, right. you know, and meet some of the players and really get, you know, really teach myself what that, part of the fiction film landscape is all about. Yeah, right. And then interestingly enough, you know, you make your first film, you, you can't get a producer yeah. on board. You can't pay them. You don't have the money to pay them. So <laughs> I was forced to become my own producer, which, um, you know, was my film school. I mean, I didn't go to film school. Right. Making Back with Hollywood became my film school. I mean, I had to learn all this stuff. I had to learn how to fundraise. I had to learn how to write grant proposals and make arguments for my film. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, I had to learn to tell a good story on film. And, and, and that was the interesting part. It was a documentary. And I, it's not like I wanted to make documentaries. I was hoping this first documentary would show off my filmmaking brilliance. Ah, and I would right. I, you know, by Hollywood or whatever, whoever hires you to make fiction films. Right. But 
you know, a funny thing happened. Um, it did really well. I mean, I really focused on the storytelling. Yeah. Um, and it really was a fun story of these three filmmakers and, you know, bouncing back and forth between the three stories. Yeah. Um, but when, and, and I got a lot of, I mean, to my great surprise, I got a lot of raves and attention. It played at festivals everywhere. It actually had a small theatrical distribution. Yeah. It went, you know, went on PBS through WGBH. I mean, success beyond my wildest dreams. That's right. Uh, for what it was, an hour long <laughs> documentary. The last. But um, I came out of it with, you know, realizing I, one of the reasons it was successful is I brought all of my aspirations for storytelling that I wanted to bring to fiction filmmaking yeah. to documentary. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just kind of instinctively went for, you know, less for like spectacular shots. It, it, you know, to me, it wasn't about the camera work, which was ironic because I had been freelancing as a cameraman for mm. many years, mm -hmm. the documentary camera but it was all about being in the service of the story yeah. and how can I shoot quickly when something's happening and don't worry about the framing so much or the lighting, you know, just get in there with the camera when the moment's happening. Follow don't that story. Right. Follow that story. That's all that counts that. And like, make sure the sound is okay. So people can hear yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, when the, when the, it was done again, I'd only done a documentary cause I, you know, I could go ahead and shoot. I could afford to make a documentary. I yeah. couldn't afford to make a fiction film. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, I tried to get a fiction film off the ground and mm -hmm. like my, my heart wasn't in it. I was so used to, you know, interacting with people with a camera in my hand as a documentary filmmaker, <laughs> the whole idea of working with actors in a script seems so phony to oh, me. Oh, wow. Wow. Amazing. I right. Know, telling people what to do and how to manipulate emotions and hit a mark was so counterintuitive to every bone in my body that I developed as a documentary cameraman that I just went, this is, this is crazy. I, I, I was working on a fiction film that, that had some, resemblance to homepage yeah then i wound up making almost the same film <laughs> and it was much better because it was real life everywhere i went i kept hearing about this great new thing called the World Wide web it's going to change the way we get information they said change the way we relate to each other it's going to change everything well, i don't know if you're, you're planning on talking to this guy justin hall he is a cyber star I realize I don't even talk to my friends that much about what's going on in my life. The web is my outlet. I went through nine years of psychotherapy. I have a lot of experience talking about myself, largely with myself. We're looking at the 20th anniversary of the film that you just mentioned, Homepage. And it's a film that, uh, that I highly recommend. And we're going to get into this film because um, it's one that I enjoyed greatly. And I think it speaks a lot about, um, well, certainly it speaks a lot about your doc life at that time, but really what would lead to other things later on, which of course we'll be getting to. So Homepage, tell us what year this happened, Doug, and uh, really... What was the impetus for making this film? And um, yeah, tell us a little bit about what, what Homepage was all about. Sure. Oh, well, the year was 1996. And um, there was this thing going on called the Internet <laughs> um, that was just kind of taking off, as was email. And um, I already sort of experienced how email could change was going to change the very nature of human relationships yeah. just by its speed and the way you went back and forth with somebody and how you actually projected onto another person because you weren't dealing with them face to face. It was through this sort of magic medium. And I, I, I knew very little about it. I, I, I'd been absorbed in this project for a year um, before that I, I, I referred to earlier, this idea of a possible fiction film that had something to do with yeah. those themes. And it, you know, it just, for various reasons, fell apart. And I was dying to jump back into documentary. Yeah. That's when I really committed full time to documentary. Yeah. And I, you know, I did what one can do when they shoot themselves. And it's the big, big advantage of working this way. I don't know if you're a camera person yourself. I am. 
but I I can go out and shoot as a one person crew. Yes, we t- and and I, we talk a lot about the value of the one person crew. We have a yeah. lot of listeners that that operate in this way. It it it's what ha- you know it made my career, yeah. and what it did was it allowed me to explore without having to raise money or even know exactly what the film was about. Um, I set out my, my goal starting out was just to somehow get to the beating heart of the internet. This, this thing called the digital revolution was happening and I knew it was going to revolutionize life on this planet as we knew it. I wanted to find the human element there. Mm. Um, I wasn't interested in how big a website was or how commercial, you know, the news angle. I wanted to know what the human connection was. And so I just went out with my camera, did a bunch of interviews. Everybody kept talking about this kid, Justin Hall, (laughs) who was doing this thing we now know as blogs, but were known then as homepages. You know, they were basically online diaries. And he had by far the most interesting online diary on the internet. I mean, he was connected to everyone. Everyone knew he was very influential. Yeah. He's now considered by no less an authority than the New York times as the founding father of personal blogs. But <laughs> it's that, amazing. Isn't it? <laughs> that, that he's a 21 year old, uh, you know, Swarthmore college student, yeah. you know, he, he just spit out everything that was going on in his life online in this crazy rapid fire, writing style that you know had been compared to Kerouac and Ginsburg and he was a good writer but totally unfiltered you know and he he has no inhibitions about writing about anything going on including his sex life and naming names and you know um in in gory detail a harbinger of things to come (laughs) in terms of the internet eh (laughs) what little we knew (laughs) He was so far ahead of his time. He was such an outlier that it was fascinating. Yeah. And and to some people off-putting, you know, that somebody would invade other people's privacy that way. Absolutely. But, you know, looking back now, it's one of the things about re-releasing it 20 years later. Oh, is it's man. so fascinating to see in this context of, a, of our culture where everybody overshares, everybody is putting up you know, details of their personal life. Justin has like a mission to go teach all these people, okay? Imagine if all your relatives had web pages and all their relatives had web pages and like some of your dead relatives had web pages telling stories about back before you were born. I think that he's gotten away with a lot of stuff. I haven't had to punch him in the nose about it, but um, he definitely pushes the line. You're a very high maintenance relationship. <laughs> You may laugh at this. It almost made me miss, dare I say, the good old days of SD four three video. <laughs> Just... uh, well, you know, shot on shot on not not mini DV. This predated mini DV. This was high eight video. If you oh, can remember, that. I remember it well. I was using high eight video in ninety four and ninety five. Yeah, I I think I might have ended it on mini DV. I I'm you? not sure. I don't think so. I think it was all. I think it was all high. What you know? What I did was I transferred it immediately to yeah. beta, beta SP. Yeah, of course, to edit it. Absolutely. So, you know, in a sense, we upresed it as best we could. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, a more stable format because I always worried that you needed backups for one thing, yeah, but also, yeah. you know, I worried about editing on um, you know those little thin small tapes <laughs> totally. uh, <laughs> so the film we're referring to is home page and uh prior to that the first film was the heck with hollywood and of course i'll have links to all of these in the show notes for this show the film home page doug it, it would actually lead you to something maybe even bigger in your life and we actually get to see this in that very film the beginnings of maybe shall we say another endeavor that you're well quite well known for and that's the D word. First of all, tell us about how the D word came to be from the making of the film homepage. Okay. Well, the D word is an online community of documentary professionals um, worldwide. Um, it's a discussion forum and a, and a community. Um, and it grew out of a blog that I kept for three years while making homepage. You know, there's something else that's, that was very, very important in my life and career that that came out as a result of, of homepage um, uh, where, <laughs> that I thought is where you were going. Mm. And that's 
homepage was my first personal doc. Yeah. And as much as I never intended to be a documentary filmmaker, I particularly never intended to be a personal documentary filmmaker. Now that I'm working on my fifth personal documentary yeah. of sorts, you know, some more personal than others, but still, um, it all came out as a result of of homepage. Um, Justin, I, you know, did a combination of you know cajoled and inspired. Um, Sweet talk, whatever you want to call it, uh, into doing my own blog. What it really was about was, you know, I wanted to experience what my subjects were going through yeah. in terms of putting stuff about their life up online for people to read. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't want to, uh, you know, invade my family's privacy in the same way. I didn't really want to get it to be that personal. So I, I focused my blog on the making of the film. Right. homepage. I right. shared my process for the three years that I was writing. Um, and I, you know, I didn't write every day. I wrote, you know, every two weeks or so yeah. I would put up a blog post, but they were long. I mean, I took it very seriously. And yeah. I was, if in the, in the end, I probably had about, you know, 50, 60 blog posts. Wow. And it was like writing a book at the same time. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. I do not recommend it. Boys and girls do not do that. I think I, I think if I wasn't the first filmmaker to ever do that, mm. I was certainly among the very first yeah. to write about their process in real time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, you know, much like what you're doing with your podcasts, I just had this image of other documentary filmmakers out there. And actually, filmmakers in in general, it, it, it didn't have to be documentary, but it was geared to documentaries. Yeah, you know, to share both the you know what I call the joy and angst of making a film, <laughs> it, it in while you're in the weeds of making it. You know, it's one thing. Almost everybody <laughs> who writes about a film, if they write an article about their film, it's usually when it's coming out. Oh yeah, and some success. Oh yeah it's written about surely it's only because it's had some success right right and like everybody can write about how you know oh i was filled with anxiety you know i had no idea when you're doing it from the perspective of you know years later when it's out and you're successful okay great you know that, that's easy to share it sure is it's it's very different when it's in real time yeah and you know you can't see the forest for the trees with your story you're in the middle of editing oh, man. Uh, why the hell did I ever think this was going to be a good <laughs> film? <laughs> this was going to work. What was I thinking? This is a disaster. Yeah. Holy yeah. shit. Where are we going to get the finishing funds for this? <laughs> and, right. you know, what, did I really just add another subject to the film? <laughs> yeah. When we went to Sundance, even, even when it had some success, you know, it's success, you know, it comes with like a boatload of anxiety. Yeah. I mean, the Sundance for the first time, uh, you know, with my own film. I, I'd been there with two films mm. I produced and done very well, but this was my own baby, you know, and it's like there's so much stress. Um, and, um, you know, anyway, I just thought this is going to be really interesting to share. I, I was, I, I took it very seriously. And I, but as I started writing it, inevitably, it got more and more personal. You, know, yeah. you, you can't. You know, you just start writing about your life and what's going on. And That's of course, right. I started writing about how, oh, this was interfering with home life here. And, you, yeah. know, we had, you know, Lucy was, I think, six when we started at nine when I was, you know, out in the world. Right. Formative years. Um, and Justin had told me all along that, you know, the more personal it gets, the more people will find it and be you interested got it. in it. Yeah, absolutely. And, it was totally true. The New York Times found out about it, did a big article. I yeah. mean, it, it it got discovered and um, inevitably it impacted the making of the film. I did not intend to put myself and my family in it. Yeah. But somewhere along the line of shooting, I realized, you know, these kids like Justin and the guys from Suck and Jamie Levy with their hellhole.com mm. site and and Malice Palace. I mean, there's just so weird. We need normal people to somehow contrast with with these others. And and so I brought my I brought my family, and I remember a distributor after the fact saying that she thought, telling me that she thought my family was the most interesting thing about the film. Oh 
Wow, like, wow, wow, wow. That's really? Interesting. Really? More yeah. than... Just, more than <laughs> I, you know, I almost took it as an insult at the time, but then when all these things started happening with the story that became... 51 Bird Street about my parents and their marriage. Yeah, yeah. I remember in the moment thinking that, you know, w w the moment the light bulb switched on and I knew that this was a story I wanted to make, yeah. I thought back to that distributor thinking, well, at least. You know what, Doug? I, I, I You know, I, I wholeheartedly agree with the distributor. Now, now maybe it's a bit un unfair because it's very subjective, right? But for me, of course, I'm, I'm watching another filmmaker as well. And so that's part of the draw for me. But yeah, I mean, I, that, that's a big part of what pulled me into homepage. And you're, you're touching upon something here that I don't think that we should, I don't think we should gloss over. And that's the idea of process. And we talk a bit about process here on the program. And honestly, uh, the, the the process of filmmaking, the process of doc, actually any kind of filmmaking, whether it's commercial, whether it's doc, whether it's feature, when you're in the process, that's my favorite thing in the world, man. You know, I, I just got back from a couple, of, like two weeks ago, I just got back from another stint filming in Cambodia. And this particular film we've been working on for four years. And, you know, these past two months filming in Cambodia, it's it's the highlight of the year. It always is. It's the process of filming, where I'm filming it, the stories that I'm filming, the people that I'm working with. It's the best part. I mean, and, and, and it shouldn't be glossed over, this idea of process. Because it's also, as you are alluding to, it's also some of the most, dif most difficult times in our lives. But I think that it's important that we embrace and understand that, you know what, it's not all about the end sort of game, the end product, if you will, the film. It's you got to embrace that process, the good right. and the bad, if you're going to be a doc filmmaker. Would you agree with that? Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, it's hard to plot out your career yeah. <laughs> as, a, as a doc filmmaker. I mean, you know, we have a lot of discussions, both on the D word and, you know, just out in the industry. I don't know if you ever went to those getting real conferences that uh, IDA, the IDA and just had it last year. Yeah. Yeah. And there are always these, you know, talks on sustainability. And I kind of laugh because like there ain't no such thing in the documentary world. There's no, you know, there's nothing sustainable about our careers. <laughs> so right. there's a handful of filmmakers out there who have made a living making doc films. Yeah, that's right. Ken Burns, Alex Gibney, you yeah. know, you know, Michael Moore, I don't know. Have I gone through them? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Anybody else I missed? Um, yeah, Steve James. <laughs> He's yeah. one of the few that we've had on this show that has makes his entire living, you know, doing docs. So yeah. there you go. I mean, it's a real rarity. You know, you know, even people like Errol Morris, you know, do a lot of commercials. He's doing commercial work, yeah. I did weddings on the side, and I, totally. I got very lucky in my, you know, in marrying someone who had actual uh, an actual job. You know, it would. Wow. You know, yeah. You know, and it's a tough life. So, yeah, you know, you, you got to be in it for the process, yeah. you know, for the experience of making these things and, you know, have a sidekick or something that just <laughs> real float. But or, getting back or, to process, yeah. you know, you'd asked about the D word. Yeah. And that, you know, that was all process. You know, I did this blog for three years. By the time homepage came out, you know, I, I, I consider when it was went on HBO, the – the end of its, um, its you know, its distribution life, yeah. um, and I was really tired of kind of you know, you know, I guess the analogy is standing on my soapbox mm. talking about documentary. About your, yeah, 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 yeah. And I just you know, and inspiring hopefully other documentary filmmakers, and you know, hopefully not depressing them too much. <laughs> um, I, you know, I was having a conversation with a friend one day who had some experience with virtual communities, mm -hmm. and I, you know, learned a bit about it by following the story of Howard Rheingold and Homepage and what he was trying to do. He was very active in virtual communities. He wrote the book, Virtual Community. And I remember telling my friend, you know, this was late August of 99, I said, uh, you know, man, documentary filmmakers, they would make such a perfect virtual community. I mean, they're... They're generous by nature. They're not in it for the money. They're they're willing to share information and encourage each other. You know, as a, as opposed to the fiction world, which strikes me as quite dog eat dog. <laughs> and, um, I, I will I will gladly devour you. Yes, your film if it helps me and my film get a little bit more attention. That's right. Whereas I think doc filmmakers are just 
generous souls who are supportive and encouraging. And anyway, he said, oh, you know, Howard has a, you know, this part of his community that he kind of can lease out. I mean, we could, we could have this up tomorrow. Wow. And I was, you know, wasn't that expensive. I said, let's do it. Yeah. It was like, it was that whimsical a notion. Yeah. And, um, you know, a couple of guys found it, you know, this idea of you put it out there, people will find it. A couple of guys found it. And after a week, these two women came on as members and they were funny and witty and charming. And, and all of a sudden guys started flocking and then women started, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, in these 20 years, it's all been word of mouth. We've never advertised. We, you know, only with the re-release of homepage, have we ever even had an article written about the D word? Really? Is that true? That can't there be is. true. We don't, we don't have advertising on the site. We don't charge membership. Right. It's free. It's all run by volunteers. Right, and I, right. you know, you say it's one of the, the most successful communities on the internet. Well, I think that is largely the reason that ah. people we put a lot of energy the first couple of years into creating this etiquette, mm. that, you know, and, and, and by example, showing that we are going to share, we are not here to snark at each other. Um, it's going to be, you know, we can rant and we can be depressed and we can, you know, be upset or, you know, but it's all within the boundaries of, of this overall etiquette of civility. Right. And I, you know, in the 20 years we've had to boot out only four people. That's, that's remarkable. As a former community moderator of a, of a, um, what would become a very well-known uh, health online resource and community uh, I think I booted probably four people a week. So that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, you know, the, I think the success is people come on, they discover it through word of mouth, the internet, what, you know, wherever it is. And they realize almost immediately that this is well intended, mm. that these are like real filmmakers. I mean, we have some many Academy Award winning filmmakers. Oh, yeah. You know, Laura Poitras and James Longley. And I mean, you know, you name it. And, and they come on and they, extremely generous with sharing experiences and information and you know you have almost any question somebody will come on you know in very short order whether it's a technical one or that you need help with like a log line for your proposal or your or your grant yeah. or you know or um, you want a, 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 a cut you know you have a short you want feedback or you're looking for a camera person in Mongolia you know, it's we have we have a member database that you can search and find, you know, camera people in Mongolia. Yeah, you know, you I name the country, that. you name the skill. I love it. Uh, it's all searchable. So I think people just really appreciate the mission behind it, which has always been uh, we want it to be worldwide, global, yeah. no fences, no, you know, and we wanted it to be for professionals. We we welcome Inexperienced filmmakers, they just have to show a sign that they're working on a film. They've worked on a film. They're not just in school. We don't we don't want beginner questions. Right. Um, but we do have a we do have an area kind of cordoned off where we have a mentoring room for people who don't you know measure up to professional status. They can there, there are certain topics that are open to non professionals, and you know we've been working for many years to kind of fill out that kind of public area. To but curate that. Right, right. What's great about the, you know, I, I consider our professional area behind barbed wire fences, a gated community where Google searches cannot find us. Or get it. <laughs> right. and so that people feel like it's a safe space. I mean, yes, we may have many members. We have over 17,000 now from 130 countries and <laughs> Only a little over half are pro members, not because the others aren't really pro. They just haven't filled out the membership form, yeah. you know, in its entirety. So I don't even think they realize they qualify. You know, we don't want beginner questions. I mean, we really want it to be at a level of, of some expertise. You know, the technical questions are, you know, are pretty advanced for the most part. Yeah. Although many come on and just say, you know, I need a really basic kind of inexpensive camera. What's the best camera? That's probably the most asked question. Of course, isn't but, it? <laughs> but the good part is we have a search engine. We just say, search for it. Have you tried this? <laughs> any answers to that, depending oh, yeah. on the... I know it well. 
But anyway, that, that's what, you know, that's what it's been going for 20 years. We have five co-hosts, again, all volunteers. I mean, but very active. We're all active filmmakers. Yeah, that's right. Um, doing it out of this impulse of, um, you know, creating community and sustaining community. And, you know, it's a tough profession because, as we said, you know, it's not sustainable and people need support. You know, they need encouragement. They need just sometimes to be heard, you know, just like have a place to get vent their frustrations. Um, <laughs> a lot of a lot of it's directed at festivals, strangely enough. Yeah, I, I'm not entirely surprised about that. I mean, that's I would say that's a, that's a top four, top five sort of topic yeah. of interest and, and recommends by our listeners. You know, Doug, I tell you, I could I could continue this this conversation for hours. Um, I, I, man, I, I'd love to have you on again at some point. We have so much in common as, as we, as we do wrap up here, Doug, building and networking a community of like-minded people, the sharing of ideas, inspiring one another. It's all what we've been talking about here. It's such a commonality between the D word and our podcast, the documentary life. It's certainly been at the heart of, of what both of us have been doing. I've only been doing it for three years here with the podcast, but you've been doing it for 20. So as we, as we sort of wrap up here, I'd love it if you could give some kind of advice on the best way to really support and nurture this, um, this doc filmmaking community that we're all uh, a big part of here globally. Wow. That's a big question to end on. Um, I guess I would just say to you, after all this time, you know, in the documentary business, you know, where do you want to end up at the end of the day? You know, what do you want to be known for? What would success career-wise look like for you? We've been speaking with Doug Block, who is an American independent director, camera person, and producer. We've mentioned a number of his films here, and we will certainly have them uh, have them listed on the show notes for this episode. We'll also have a link and more information, links to The D Word, his online community that's now in its 20th year. Doug, what a pleasure having you on. Um, it's been a great yes. conversation. As I mentioned, we have so many mutual interests, mutual endeavors, and uh, we have a, a large like-minded community out there. And, and hopefully we're inspiring them and informing them in the best ways that we can. Doug, thank you so much for being on The Documentary Life. Thanks, Chris. It was fun. Hey, Doc Lifer, I have a couple small favors I'd like to ask of you. We want to be able to continue bringing this free podcast to you on a weekly basis. We believe it's an important asset to the Doc community, and we hope that you do too. So, if you're a Doc filmmaker and a regular listener of The Documentary Life, and you find value in what we bring to the Doc community, why not tell a doc filmmaking friend about our podcast? Call or email a friend today or share us on your social media. And after that, why not head on over to iTunes and give us a rating and review? We have just under 100 of those currently, so we'd love to be able to top the century mark by the end of this month. And to make it easy, we've even put up a direct link to the iTunes link in the show notes for this episode. So please, just take five minutes today and share the documentary life with a friend, and then give TDL an iTunes rating and review. In advance, thanks for taking the time to help us keep bringing you the documentary life each and every week. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.